Hello, everyone. Welcome to the BIGS webinar. Today, uh, we are going to start in just a moment. Thank you. Welcome again. We are going to get started now. And uh, Samantha, one of our BASG students, is going to kick us off with introductions. Thank you, Samantha. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending this Behavioral Insights Group faculty webinar with Julia Minson and our co-author, Michael Yamans. And um, so Julia Minson is an associate professor of public policy at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And she's a social psychologist with research interests in conflict, negotiations, judgment, and decision making. Her primary line of research addresses the psychology of disagreement. How do people engage with opinions, judgments, and decisions that are different from their own? And at the Kennedy School, Julia is affiliated with the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and the Center for Public Leadership. She teaches co courses on negotiations and decision making as part, of, as part of the management, leadership, and decision science area, as well as through HKS Executive Education. Prior to coming to the Kennedy School, Julia served as a lecturer at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, where she taught negotiations at both the MBA and the undergraduate levels. She received her PhD in psychology from, in social psychology from Stanford University and her BA in psychology from Harvard University. Um, and Michael is an incoming assistant professor in the Department of Management and Entrepreneurship at Imperial College Business School and a, fellow, and a faculty fellow at the Imperial College Data Science Institute. Prior to this role, he served as a postdoctoral fellow for Harvard Business School and for Harvard Institute for Quantitative Social Science. His research focuses on the dig digital transformation of conversation, how machine learning and natural language processing can be used to improve the ways we connect with and learn from each other. He has published research in top journals studying many types of important conversations outside the lab, including online education, negotiations, recommender systems, workplace feedback, and speed dating. And with that, I will hand it over to them so they can begin. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm particularly excited to be able to uh, do this uh, talk in partnership with Mike, um, who will kind of keep an eye on the chat and be able to answer some questions in real time. Um, and then all of us together can have uh, sort of a nice conversation afterwards about the data and the research. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to see all of your uh, responses and perspectives. Um, the work that I want to share with you today is motivated by a question that has really driven a lot of my research program, um, and that is the question of how do people engage with the views and opinions of those who they disagree with, uh, either in terms of their uh, political beliefs, their values, or even sort of like the fundamental facts of what's real and what is fake about the world. Um, if we look around uh, the world we're living in today, uh, you might say that sort of the very fabric of democracy is fraying before our eyes. Uh, and I would make an argument that one of the reasons for that is that people have such an incredibly difficult time engaging with those that they strongly disagree with. Now, a fundamental assumption that underpins my work is that engagement with opposing views is important and beneficial. We know from research on uh, judgment and decision making that when people give heavy consideration to opinions and forecasts they disagree with, their accuracy is improved. We know that in organizations, encouraging minority perspectives improves retention and organizational loyalty. And of course, in the context of conflict, we know that when parties feel heard, that conflict is less likely to escalate. Now, the research notwithstanding, uh, organizations and people in general have a really, really hard time uh, sort of garnering the benefits of thoughtful engagement with disagreeing others. Um, and so a lot of my work has focused on trying to uh, sort of really understand and measure uh, a psychological construct that we call receptiveness to opposing views. 
Now, we define receptiveness as the willingness to access, consider, and evaluate supporting and opposing views in a relatively impartial manner. And that definition is kind of a mouthful, um, but I'm going to be talking about ideas sort of related to receptiveness for the rest of the session. And so it's useful to stop and kind of think about, you know, why we define it this way. So first of all, notice that we are thinking about receptiveness as a difference in how you treat things you agree with and things you disagree with, right? So we're not particularly interested in like, are you a smart person who is curious about things in the world and who likes to think deep thoughts, right? So everybody on this call would qualify as receptive if that was our definition. We're interested particularly in situations where if conflict and disagreement exist, right, do you treat views on your side differently than views on the opposing side? In other words, do you sort of give privileged place in your mind to things that support ideas you already believe in? Um, the other thing that's very important about the definition is that we think of receptiveness in terms of all the things that have to happen in order for a person to really engage with a piece of information. So we think about it in terms of accessing information, you know, what do you read, what do you listen to, who do you talk to, then consideration, which means how much time and attention do you actually give these ideas, right? Do you really think about them? Uh, and finally, evaluation. So do you use the same yardstick to evaluate the quality of arguments for your own beliefs versus for opposing beliefs? Now, a very important piece of, our def of the definition is also what's missing from it. And what is nowhere in the definition is anything about attitude change, right? So in other words, if you are a very receptive person, it doesn't mean that you have to go around the world changing your mind every time you hear an opposing argument. Receptiveness is about thoughtful engagement with other perspectives. It's not necessarily about compromise or changing your own sort of deeply held views. So, that gives us sort of an idea of how we think about receptiveness and what it is. How do we measure it? So in a recent paper, um, we developed and validated a self-report scale of receptiveness, right? In other words, a questionnaire that allows people to report to us how receptive they are uh, as they go through their life. Uh, the questionnaire is 18 items long. Uh, this is just sort of a smattering of them. This is six out of the 18. Uh, and all of them ask them ask people to agree or disagree with statements that describe how they act or how they feel when they encounter something they strongly disagree with. Now, in the course of developing this questionnaire and validating, it, we were able to sort of experimentally test the predictions of our theory. And so we find that indeed, people who are higher on receptiveness as measured by our questionnaire scale do actually expose themselves to a more balanced set of information. So for example, uh, participants who are higher on the questionnaire uh, are more likely to view websites from senators who are on their same political side of their political divide or on the opposite side. Uh, we know that people who are high in receptiveness are better at maintaining attention to counter attitudinal content when it's shown to them in an experimental setting. And we know that they evaluate arguments for and against their perspective uh, sort of in a more even handed manner. Um, one study uh, that we conducted in the course of eval validating the questionnaire uh, was a study that really looked at can this construct predict behavior over time. Um, and what we did is we administered the receptiveness scale to participants right before the 2016 presidential election. So we got a bunch of registered voters and we gave them the scale. And then we followed up with them uh, on the week of President Trump's inauguration. And what we found 
was that voters who opposed President Trump but were more receptive, according to their responses in early November, were indeed more likely to watch the inauguration uh, and were more willing to uh, kind of consume a more balanced set of news outlets about the inauguration and uh, sort of the related events than voters who also opposed President Trump but were less receptive. So in other words, what we see is that receptiveness is stable over time, right? It predicts behavior from early November to mid-January, uh, and it predicts behavior both in sort of laboratory experimental settings as well as out in the world. So as a psychologist, this is very exciting. We have a construct. It predicts individual level behavior. Uh, we can use it to see sort of how people engage with opposing views. Um, but a really big important set of questions remains, and that's where I want to turn to for the rest of this talk. Namely, receptiveness is a deeply interpersonal construct, right? You cannot be receptive by yourself in a vacuum. You always have to have somebody else whose ideas you disagree with in order to then either be receptive to those ideas or not be receptive to those ideas. Um, and so the more recent work that we have been working on uh, is how does receptiveness impact interpersonal interactions? Um, and that is uh, the paper I want to spend uh, most of the uh, time on today. This is the work that uh, we uh, worked on together with Mike, uh, where we really got into sort of the nuts and bolts of how does receptiveness impact conflict uh, I'm going to show you three studies from this paper. Um, if we are lucky, I will show you a fourth bonus study, which I really like. Um, but in the first study, uh, we're going to look at sort of the consequences of being perceived as receptive, right? If, I, if my counterpart sees me as being more receptive, does that do anything to our relationship? Uh, in the second study, we're really going to get into the details of how you measure receptiveness uh, in terms of how it is expressed in conversation. Um, and finally, in the last study, I'm going to show you an intervention that we developed uh, that allows us to help people express greater conversational receptiveness and thereby uh, really improve these conversations they have with holders of opposing views. Um, we are big believers in uh, open science, uh, so all of the data I'm going to show you today is publicly available as well as uh, pre-registered, um, and I will also show you um, uh, Wait, uh, I, I will show you the link directly to go get all of our code, so um, everybody is sort of welcome to use our materials and replicate our data. Okay. So the first study uh, that I want to show you uh, is research that uh, we conducted in the context of an executive education program conducted uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, so this is a program for uh, executives in state and local government. Uh, so these are folks like, you know, mayors, police chiefs, fire chiefs, uh, maybe controllers of states or municipalities. Uh, fairly uh, you know, experienced public service professionals. Um, and they come to the Kennedy School every summer in groups of 60 to 70 participants at a time. Um, they come for a three week long program. Um, and I teach in that program every year. And so that uh, sort of gave me the opportunity to conduct this experiment. Um, on the first day of the program, before the participants really had a chance to get to know each other and form relationships, we collected some data. First of all, we gave them the receptiveness scale, what we're calling dispositional receptiveness. In other words, how uh, receptive are you kind of on average as you go through your life? Um, and then we collected their attitudes on important controversial hot button issues, right? So these were um, things that were um, 
debated uh, in the press and among our participants. Uh, you will see questions uh, about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. We started this work right as that movement uh, was taking shape a few years ago. Um, and you know other things like legalizing uh, recreational marijuana, so uh, sexual assault issues, so uh, very kind of important and heavy topics. Um, on the second day of this uh, program, we brought all these participants uh, into the Harvard Decision Science Lab. Um, and we were able to pair them up with somebody else in the program with whom they strongly disagreed. So the Decision Science Lab uh, has a bunch of cubicles that allows us to see participants uh, sort of privately from each other. So they know they're talking to somebody in the lab, but they don't know who they're talking to. Um, and so their responses are uh, confidential and anonymous. And we asked them to discuss uh, a particular assigned topic with this other participant with whom they were matched because we knew from the prior questionnaire that they disagreed on this important topic. Um, the way the interaction unfolded is that uh, I, let's say as a participant, let's say Mike and I are paired in this interaction, I would write out my perspective on this particular issue, Mike would write out his opposing perspective, uh, and then we would both click send and our perspectives would get exchanged. And so then I would see, oh, here's a person that disagrees with me, and I would respond to his initial uh, point of view, and he would respond to mine. And then we went like this for five rounds of uh, conversation, which took 20 minutes to half an hour. So we got quite a bit of text uh, for these sort of experienced uh, public servants. What we're interested in is, does it matter whether in this type of conversation where you're talking to somebody you strongly disagree with, does it matter whether you are being receptive? Okay, um, and so to get at that question, we asked participants at the end of the exchange to evaluate how receptive they believed they had been and how receptive they thought their partner was being. Okay, we also asked them to answer a series of questions about how much they would like to collaborate with this person in the future, right? To the extent that uh, receptiveness makes any difference, it would be nice if people who are seen as more receptive uh, have a better chance at having productive collaborations with each other uh, down the line. Uh, the way we ask those questions uh, is the following. So we ask three questions uh, related to people's intentions to work with each other. Uh, we ask participants how much they would like to have their partner on their team. Um, we asked them how much they trust their partner's judgment, and we asked uh, them how much they would want their partner to represent them to another organization. And all of this was in the context of the executive participants knowing that I would be teaching them in a couple of weeks and that they would be actually doing a team decision-making exercise with the, uh, with the peers in their class. So to them, you know, this is sort of input into a real set of collaborations that they will be engaging in uh, during the program. Now, these items turned out to be very highly correlated. So uh, sort of going forward, I'm going to treat them as sort of one index of future collaboration intention. And so the first thing we see is that indeed, when people see their partner as being receptive, they are more interested in collaborating with them, right? So this is sort of a very, very robust relationship. If I think my partner is receptive, even though I was, I'm talking to somebody that I disagree with on this very important topic, I am more willing to work with them in the future. But this is a little bit of a black box that to some extent raises more questions than it answers. Most importantly, we don't know what people mean when they think that somebody is being receptive, right? If I say somebody is receptive, why am I saying that? What cues am I responding to? Secondly, we also observed a really low correlation between self-rated receptiveness and partner-rated receptiveness. 
So to the extent that being rated as receptive by your partner had these nice positive interpersonal outcomes, uh, those partner ratings were uh, very weakly correlated with people's own ratings of their own behavior. And so what that suggests is that somewhere there is a disconnect, right? There is something about how people are evaluating themselves that's different than how partners are evaluating them. And so to really get under the hood of all of this and to understand uh, how receptiveness sort of is expressed and unfolds in conversation, uh, we developed a natural language processing algorithm. Now, this was my first, uh, my first opportunity to learn about this, and Mike was my teacher. Um, and this is really kind of an incredible set of tools that I uh, really encourage you know, many of you to try to get familiar with and understand better. Um, so I'm going to uh, kind of explain it at a high level um, and then show you uh, some examples of what this looks like. Um, so how do you develop a natural language processing algorithm for something like this? The first step that we took is we collected 20 position statements on two different controversial topics. So we had 10 statements about uh, Black Lives Matter, and we had 10 statements about what a university should do when a uh, sexual assault accusation is made of campus, on campus. Uh, and of the 10 statements on each of those topics, five statements supported one policy proposal and five statements uh, supported the opposing policy proposal, okay? So we have these 20 statements and then we collected a large sample of online participants and we presented each of those online participants with a statement that they disagreed with. So a statement that contradicted their own uh, expressed position on that particular topic. We then asked these online participants to write short essays in response to the statement. Okay, so now we have kind of a whole bunch of people that are responding to something they disagree with. We then collected yet another sample of online participants. Notice that this is now sort of even more people. Um, these participants in step three are our raters. And we asked our raters to evaluate how receptive the people in step two were in regard to the statements they had to read from step one, okay? So importantly, the participants in step three disagreed with the participants in step two, which means by definition, they share the perspective expressed by the statement in step one. So this now gives us sort of a ground truth of how receptive was the text in step two, because we had a bunch of people who disagreed, right? So on average, 4.9 raters per response rate how receptively that text is being perceived. So now we have a library essentially of texts and we have raters who evaluated how receptive that text appears to them. The final step is sort of the magic, uh, is training an algorithm to pick out the features in the step two texts that make the human in step three rate them as receptive, okay? So we're looking for words and phrases, features of text that make the text in step two come across as being receptive to the disagreeing raters. Okay, now this all sounds a little bit abstract and high level and I'm going to tell, sort of make it more concrete for you in two different ways. So first of all, uh, as I said, we're big believers in open science. Uh, so if you want to uh, run the code yourself, if you want to uh, use the algorithm, uh, everything is available on Mike's GitHub page. Uh, and this is uh, also the code to run uh, the algorithm uh, in R if you are a R user. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, work through a specific example, pretending that you are the algorithm. Okay, so uh, humans 
and algorithms are obviously very, very different things, but we're going to sort of pretend that you are in the position of being our algorithm and you have to figure out how receptive a particular piece of text is. So I'm going to show you two pieces of text that were written by two people responding to the same statement. So they saw the same thing, okay, and they responded to it. They're different people, but they share the same opinion. What I want you to do as the algorithm is figure out which of these two pieces of text is more receptive. So if you think the first piece of text is more receptive, please put a one in the chat. And if you think the second piece of text is more receptive, please put a two in the chat and then we will see how good we are at this task. Okay, so here comes the first piece of text. Okay, here's the second piece of text. Remember that these are folks responding to the same prompt. So of course, uh, the topic is the same. Okay, so it seems like we have pretty overwhelming consensus that the first statement is uh, the more receptive of the two statements. Um, now, I made the task easy for you because actually being an algorithm is really hard. Um, and the way I made the task easy for you is that I cherry pick these statements. So the first statement is actually uh, one of the most receptive statements that we have uh, in our data set. Uh, and the second statement is one of the least receptive statements that we have in our data set. But notice something tricky. We can mostly agree that the first one sounds more receptive, but it's really hard to figure out why, right? Like, what is it about this thing that sounds right? And this is where algorithms are sort of far superior to humans because when we wrote our algorithm, we could then understand what exactly it was that made the first piece of text seem more receptive than the second one. And importantly, every time the algorithm does it, it's going to give you the same answer, right? So an algorithm's work is completely reproducible. And of course, it can do it much faster with a lot more text uh, than any humans could. So uh, what the algorithm does uh, is it, counts features of receptive language uh, in terms of how often they occur in a particular uh, piece of text. So on the y-axis here, what you see are features of language. On the x-axis is the average number of times that each of those features is used in particular responses. Um, the red bars are going to show you the number of times a particular feature is used in the third of responses that were evaluated as being least receptive. Uh, and the blue bars are going to show you the number of times that a particular feature is used in the third of responses that's evaluated as most receptive. So I'm going to show you some concrete examples. So uh, both negation and reasoning uh, are more characteristic of unreceptive text than receptive text. So negation is things like not, don't, won't, can't, no. Uh, and reasoning is like a favorite of mine because reasoning is what academics do all the time to sound smart. Um, reasoning words are things like because and therefore. Um, they sound smart, uh, but they don't sound very receptive. Now, uh, a lot of the features that are more characteristic of receptive text than unreceptive text, uh, are sort of very intuitively uh, interpretable. And that's one of the benefits of this algorithm is we can look under the hood and really understand what makes for receptiveness. So for example, acknowledgement is showing that you are listening to your partner. It's phrases like, I understand that you are saying X, Y, Z, or I hear you saying, et cetera, et cetera. Um, hedges, are ways of showing that uh, your statements are not absolute. So it's words like perhaps and sometimes. Um, 
looking for areas of agreement is something that's important uh, and people are often sort of resistant to because agreement might sound like compromising or sound like giving up on your positions. But really what we're looking for here is finding areas of agreement in the midst of the disagreement, right? Recognizing that there are certain points that we as sort of humans can all agree on. Um, so let me then take these features, which are the features that our algorithm produced, and tie them back to the example that we were working through. So remember these two statements. Uh, they differ based on these specific five features, negation, reasoning, acknowledgement of the other's perspective, hedging, and finding areas of agreement. So if you look at the first more receptive statement, uh, I understand is an acknowledgement, probably as a hedge. I can also see is another acknowledgement. I agree is showing that you recognize an area of agreement, but possibly sometimes is a hedge. Whereas the unreceptive response is full of these unreceptive cues, namely do not and can't are negations and therefore because and the other because are all sort of reasoning words. So part of the reason that these two statements are so different from each other is that there's like no overlap in features. Okay, so we now have this tool and we can go back to our state and local government data uh, and try to really unpack what was happening in those conversations. Remember I told you that uh, we have this uh, sort of important dependent variable of how willing are people to collaborate with their conversation partners despite the fact that they disagree on these hot button topics. Uh, and I showed you earlier on in that scatter plot that how receptive you believe your partner is uh, is very predictive of your willingness to collaborate with them, okay? Now that we have the algorithm, it turns out that the algorithm's evaluation of your partner's receptiveness based strictly on their text uh, is also very significantly predictive of an individual's willingness to work with that partner in the future. Now, importantly and interestingly, people's ratings of their own receptiveness, in other words, how receptive I think I generally am in life or how receptive I think I was in this particular interaction, are not predictive of your partner's uh, willingness to interact with you. And because we have the algorithm, we can again look under the hood and try to understand what it is that people are getting wrong. So these are the features I showed you uh, a second ago that address how, uh, that address sort of the features of language that partners recognize as being receptive. We can do the same exact exercise by looking at the features of language that people consider receptive in themselves. In other words, what are the features that I give myself high grades for? Um, and what you see is that, I mean, first of all, it just looks visually like a different graph. Um, if we try to interpret a little bit what the difference is, a lot of the features that pop out of the self ratings have to do with formality. So people think that using informal titles like hey man or hey dude is unreceptive. They think that using formal titles like ma'am or sir is more receptive. They think that swearing is unreceptive. Of course, none of these features came up in the partner ratings, which were much more about sort of engagement um, and really sort of digging into the issue rather than uh, kind of the formality of the language. So what we have so far is that conversational receptiveness, receptiveness as expressed in language, possesses specific interpretable consistent linguistic markers, but people misperceive them when they're evaluating themselves. Importantly, conversational receptiveness predicts positive interpersonal outcomes, even when you control for how much people disagree with each other. Um, given the time, I'm going to have time for my bonus study that I'm very excited to share with you. Um, in our bonus study, 
uh, we use Wikipedia data uh, that I will show you sort of in a little more detail. Um, and what we can do, what we're going to do is we're going to use the algorithm to actually produce, predict conflict escalation over time um, in distributed teams. Um, and what that allows us to do is actually look a little bit at how receptiveness unfolds uh, in the course of a conversation. So let me show that data to you in more detail so you kind of know what I mean. Okay, so Wikipedia. Uh, almost all of us have used it to look up information, um, but maybe if you are a very frequent uh, user, you will notice that there is this little tab at the top of every Wikipedia page um, called the talk page. And on the talk page, Wikipedia editors uh, are allowed to disagree with each other. Uh, it exists so that people can edit other people's uh, contributions and sort of debate uh, what is sort of the true factual information and how it should be organized. Um, so for example, this is uh, the Wikipedia page for whiskey, the beverage. Maybe some of us have been enjoying it a little too much during the pandemic. Um, other people have been debating the proper spelling of the word. Okay, so if you look at the page, uh, at the talk page for whiskey, there is a robust debate about whether there should be an E before the Y or whether it should not be an E before the Y. It starts out uh, very civil as a conversation about where there is more of the beverage produced uh, and sort of the history of the word. Uh, and then towards the end, uh, it starts uh, getting a little testy uh, where there is uh, an individual who supports, uh, it seems like the Irish uh, spelling, arguing that uh, the fact that the English and the Scots can't spell should come as no surprise. Now, this is getting dangerously close to something that Wikipedia calls a personal attack. Uh, Wikipedia has uh, tens of thousands of editors uh, working uh, in distributed teams all around the world uh, to produce correct information. And so it is very important to them as an organization that these conversations remain productive and civil. So they have an entire policy and in fact a set of Wikipedia pages addressing personal attacks, uh, what they are, how they should be prevented, and most importantly how they should be sanctioned. Um, with that in mind, uh, we were able to look at uh, conversations using our algorithm and see, can we predict conflict escalation as defined by Wikipedia? Um, uh, in this research, we uh, are very uh, grateful to a group of computer scientists from Cornell, Zhang et al, uh, who developed a data set where they were able to talk, they were able to take talk threads from Wikipedia pages uh, that were matched on topic and length uh, and create pairs of these threads, one of which devolved into a personal attack and one of which did not. So this is a sort of synthetic control where we know that, uh, you know, for any pair of threads, uh, things are going to go badly 50% of the time. The question is, can we use our algorithm to predict the personal attack? Even more importantly, uh, what we do in this particular study is we feed the first exchange in the conversation uh, through the algorithm. Because if we can, you know, if we can predict uh, the outcome, if we can predict the personal attack from the early threads, right, that tells us that receptiveness essentially changes the tone of the conversation from the beginning onward. Okay, so on the y-axis here uh, is how accurately the algorithm predicts the attack. 50% uh, is chance, right, because there's two threads and one of them ends in an attack, so 50-50 is chance. Uh, on the x-axis is how uh, receptive a particular editor, a participant in this conversation was. Now the first thing we see is that the receptiveness of the attacker, right, the person who actually launched the attack at the end, uh, significantly predicts the likelihood of that happening, right? So people who are unreceptive in the beginning of the conversation are more likely to launch a personal attack at the end of the conversation than their more receptive counterparts. 
perhaps more interestingly, uh, this relationship is even stronger when we look at the language of the person who was attacked, right? So not to like blame the victim, but a little bit to blame the victim. Uh, in this type of situation, when people are unreceptive in their language at the beginning of the conversation, they are likely to receive a personal attack by the end of the conversation, okay? So one of the things that this tells us, right, is that first of all, uh, our algorithm is able to predict uh, conversational receptiveness on a huge variety of topics, which is what's covered in Wikipedia. Many of them are non-political. Um, and also very importantly, that conversation, that receptiveness affects conversations over time, right? So what happens at the beginning affects what happens at the end. Okay, so this is the final study I want to show you today. Um, and this is a study where we wanted to intervene on people's conversations. Uh, the idea is that we all want to uh, presumably be better at having civil conversations with opposing uh, holders of opposing views. Uh, and people seem to not be very good at knowing what are the right things to say. Um, so can we train them? Uh, we followed the same procedure as we used uh, in the earlier study I described uh, to design the algorithm. Uh, we had participants write responses to statements they disagree with, but in this case, we randomly assigned them to a treatment where they received training on conversational receptiveness versus a control group. We then recruited a sample of raters who again disagreed with our writers as in the prior study. Uh, and the raters evaluated the text produced by the writers uh, in terms of do they want to work with these people in the future, right? So the future collaborations and collaboration intentions that I mentioned earlier, and also were their attitudes at all swayed. Furthermore, we were curious whether the writers who were or were not trained had any kind of sense of what receptiveness would do to their conversations. So we asked the writers to predict the rater evaluation, right? In other words, what do you think a person who disagrees with you will say about you after they read uh, the text you produced? Okay, here is the training we gave people. Um, it's very, very simple. It took probably less than five minutes for participants to complete. So these are the features that the algorithm uh, picked out as being very predictive of being perceived as receptive. Uh, and we taught them to our participants using this silly example about uh, liking cats more than liking dogs. Uh, so we taught participants to use positive affirming statements to acknowledge the other person's views to use hedges to soften their claims, and to try to find points of agreement. We gave our participants uh, a quiz to make sure that they uh, understood how to apply these conversational features. Um, and the participants in the control condition had to read, uh, they had to read an article about a new species of fish. Uh, and they had to take a quiz about the fish uh, so that we're sure that in both conditions, uh, we had people who had exerted sort of roughly the same amount of intellectual effort on doing this particular task. Okay, so the first thing that we see is that the raters did have more positive interaction intentions towards participants who were trained in conversational receptiveness. In other words, we saw in our prior study that when people express conversational receptiveness, uh, observers want to work with them more. But now we see that this is something that can be trained uh, in you know, a fairly simple way. Importantly, uh, the writers anticipated this. They're like, yeah, you know, if I, if I talk in this way, things will probably go better, right? So the writers anticipated that using conversational receptiveness would benefit the evaluations that the raters gave them. The second uh, piece that we wanted to know about was whether conversational receptiveness was persuasive. Uh, the 
position had changed, where zero means no, it hasn't. Uh, positive numbers mean that I have been somewhat persuaded to uh, the opposing point of view. Uh, and negative numbers means that this person was so aversive that I have actually moved even stronger in the opposite direction. Um, and this is sort of a very interesting result where we see that conversational receptiveness is actually more persuasive, okay? So all of our participants who read uh, an opposing perspective on average moved a small amount in the direction that uh, was being advocated by what they read, but people who use conversational receptiveness were more persuasive than people who use their own sort of natural conversational style. Importantly, writers did not uh, anticipate this benefit. So first of all, writers like vastly overestimated how persuasive they were, uh, but they did not recognize that using conversational receptiveness would help their cause. So in sum, um, we have uh, really tried to approach this very important problem of getting people to engage with opposing views from a multitude of perspectives. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about these constructs and figuring out how to measure them both uh, in terms of self-report and in terms of how they're expressed uh, in behavior and in terms of how they impact interpersonal interactions. Um, and I think part of the uh, part of what I'm so excited about with this work is that we've really kind of pushed the boundaries methodologically uh, in terms of what normally happens in this types of research. Uh, so first of all, we work very hard to study receptiveness in uh, a truly interpersonal manner where whenever we can, we're actually pairing people with holders of opposing views uh, and allowing them to interact in some way. Um, Natural language processing has been just a hugely eye-opening experience for me um, that I encourage uh, a lot of you to uh, sort of get in, get in on. There's a, a tremendous amount of recorded text out there um, and it is just like an untapped treasure trove of data and insights. Um, and one of the things that uh, we have really tried to do also is look at how conversations unfold over time, right? So instead of just like looking at one conversational turn, can we get people to really um, discuss? Um, the future direction that I'm incredibly excited about is can we take our little intervention and make it big? Right. Can we uh, try to take this to the field and really improve conversations and conflict at scale? Uh, and of course, a lot of folks in this audience uh, do field experiments, and I would love to hear from you uh, if you think there's uh, a good partnership here to uh, intervene on conversations, maybe on social media um, or in sort of more traditional news outlets. Um, and can we sort of improve public discourse in that way? Um, I am excited to uh, take your questions. And before that, I would like to uh, thank my awesome team of co-authors. All right, that's a lot of information. I bet you the chat has many things in it. <laughs> great job, Julia. Um, we do have some great questions in the chat. Um, so uh, let me let me see if I can read some out to you. I, I'd love to hear what you have to think too. So um, uh, first, let's start with uh, Jennifer Lerner has a great question here, and she is asking what percentage of po the population today would say they'd like to increase their receptivity, and could this be an obstacle to training? Um, so I think that's I think that's a great question. Um, you know, it's a funny. I, I think there definitely is sort of a resistance, uh, and in part, it comes from the idea that people misperceive receptiveness as being closely related to attitude change. So. Um, in uh, a lot of our sort of open-ended da data, uh, people seem to express this late belief that like, if I talk to somebody, then I have to at least slightly change my mind. 
Um, and they often forget about the fact that conversations and sort of thoughtful conversations have other downstream benefits besides persuasion. Um, in fact, uh, I have new work with uh, Hannah Collins uh, and Francesca Gino and Charlie Dorison, uh, where we look at the conversational goals people have um, and there's sort of a very, very large self-other difference there where people believe that they have sort of well-rounded goals of both learning from the other side and uh, persuading the other side, whereas the other side is only out to persuade. Um, so I think part of the reason that people might be resistant to increasing their receptiveness is because they are under the impression that they're already receptive. Um, which uh, probably is a little too self-serving. That's a great point. Um, so I'm, I'm, there's so many good questions coming through here. I'm trying to keep up with it. But it looks like at least a few co people have asked a uh, question about whether the results of these studies apply to different languages or different cultures or different, different contexts. Uh, Amy Jackson asked about the UK in particular, but a few other folks are asking about uh, some other cultures. So I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Um, so Mike, that's one that I'm sort of tempted to lob right back at you uh, since you are a language expert. But one thing I would say is that um, we have uh, trained and tested the algorithm across a number of different topics. So we know that it applies from topic to topic and context to context. Um, but I would love to hear what your thoughts are on going from language to language. That's a great point. Well, uh, I, I mentioned the politeness detector is focused mostly on English. So we are expanding out from there. You can imagine even within the English language there are differences and I think the UK is a good example there. Um, so uh, we've, we've had some, a lot of success expanding outwards from our current domain and, and it keeps working. I'm sure as we, get into bigger and broader populations, we'll start to find cases where we need to retrain our algorithm and maybe learn some local uh, differences. That's something I'm excited about, Julia. I don't know about you. Yeah, well, and that's another call for uh, collaborations out to sort of this worldwide audience we have here. Um, if, uh, if folks have access to a population in conflict that speaks different language, that's willing to write essays and answer questionnaires, uh, we want to hear from you. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Ron Hafitz has a couple of questions. Uh, let me try and get to these. So the first one he asked is um, uh, whether the uh, politeness differences will be different in a chat versus in person or face to face. And, and what, what, do you, what do you think the results might hold there? Yeah, so I think, you know, the cues that we're using in language, right, is a limited set of cues compared to what you have available to you when you are face to face, right? So when you're face to face, of course, there's additional uh, things that people can rely on in terms of sort of body language, eye contact, facial expression, smiling. Um, and that would be a very interesting, that would be a very interesting work to get into. Um, that being said, a tremendous amount of our communication right now is happening by text. Um, and so I think it's very, very applicable to try to get a good handle on that uh, domain. Uh, but certainly, you know, other, other cues can enrich our ability to sort of both measure and detect receptiveness. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Uh, there's another, two people seem to also be asking a similar question here, Ashwini and uh, uh, Margarita. Uh, they both noted that the, uh, rece the recipe seems to resemble some other training, uh, for example, for therapists who conduct support groups or uh, training for uh, nonviolent communication. So uh, what do you think the contribution is that we make in this paper that maybe isn't in some of those existing trainings? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things that uh, comes across often when we do sort of really good, careful empirical work, right, is that, you know, people are good lay psychologists. Uh, and certainly, you know, we, 
we know how to go through life and most of the time we are all right at measuring conflict. Um, we are trying to be uh, quite a bit sort of more precise about it uh, and understand a little bit, have a more uh, precise and empirically driven evidence base for some of the things that have been recommended for a very, very long time. Um, we're also able to, because of the algorithm, we're able to sort of scale our measurement in a way that uh, you can't if you're relying on human raters, uh, even though the, if they're even if they're extremely uh, well trained human raters. Um, so you know, part of what we're doing is we're certainly validating the truth and the wisdom behind uh, some of the advice that has existed for a long time. And part of it was we're kind of curating and to say, look, of all those things we've tried before, here are the ones that seem to have the most predictive power. And here are the ones that are like, you know, nice to have, but don't do, don't do as much work. Mike, what do you think about that? You've been thinking about these things for a long time too. I, I think that's right. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, residents with existing models. And, um, you know, I, I, I like the, the comfort of a, of a computational approach. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of received wisdom in that, uh, in the existing literature that really informs a lot of the specific work we do. So I, I think there's a lot of agreement across um, that building literature. Um, I'm going to ask two questions here that I think are a little bit related. So Rose Wang is wondering whether there are any gender implications of the receptiveness uh, algorithm. And then also, um, who is it? Oh, somebody anonymous uh, is asking whether uh, the linguistic cues of receptiveness relate to power dynamics between individuals. So I'm wondering if you could say something about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so both great questions. Um, so the, the gender question we can answer with our existing data, uh, basically to say that if you look at people's unmanipulated uh, conversational receptiveness, uh, women are much higher in it than men. Um, so women are naturally quite good at conversational receptiveness. Um, and there's sort of an interesting twist to this, which is that, you know, there is an extensive literature um, on uh, women in negotiation and uh, sort of the uh, various hurdles that women face as negotiators. Uh, one interesting implication of the fact that women are better at conversational receptiveness is perhaps women might be very successful mediators. Um, and so one of the things that we are uh, looking forward to doing is conducting more of these studies where we explicitly vary uh, the gender of participants uh, and see uh, if we can actually uh, find you know, a situation in which uh, conversational receptiveness is particularly beneficial um, and women kind of uniquely enjoy that benefit. Um, I think the power question is super interesting uh, and again is one of the kind of many situational, uh, uh, situational factors that will impact uh, these dynamics. So one of the questions that I often hear, especially in these very uh, contentious political times, is how would a leader be perceived when that leader uh, acts receptive to uh, an opponent, wouldn't it be really bad if, you know, Elizabeth Warren sat down with Ted Cruz? Wouldn't we think worse of her uh, for being receptive to somebody we strongly disagree with? Um, and that is sort of an open uh, empirical question that I think can be uh, very readily addressed. Uh, but looking at, uh, looking at kind of the entire social situation uh, is definitely kind of the next step in this research program. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many good questions. I don't know if we're going to get to them all. A lot of people have some really great suggestions for places where we can apply this algorithm. For example, in doctor's offices, in content moderation. I think some of these some of these examples are really fascinating. Um, I, I, let me ask you a question from uh, Gretchen Chapman. So um, she asks, she wonders whether receptiveness is associated with um, having a moderate position, and also uh, whether there's a case in which uh, people uh, uh, think that uh, something about receptiveness signals a, a lack of uh, extremism. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I wonder whether you think uh, that's part of what's going on here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, 
Yes, receptiveness. So in the, um, in the studies that I mentioned early on in the talk where we were looking at uh, the receptiveness scale and the extent to which it predicts individual level information processing, um, in those studies, we're able to uh, explicitly look at the strength of people's attitudes. Uh, and so yes, receptiveness is uh, negatively correlated with attitude extremities. So people who are more receptive dispositionally tends to tend to hold less extreme attitudes. That being said, uh, in all the studies uh, that we uh, did in that paper to validate the scale, we can control for attitude extremity uh, and show that receptiveness is still predictive of information processing uh, above and beyond uh, attitude extremity. Um, and, and I think you know that may be part of um, that may be part of the interpersonal reaction. Certainly the kind of hedging feature of the algorithm uh, signals that, you know, I'm a person who, you know, it, it's not necessarily that you have a weaker attitude, but maybe that you're more able to recognize nuance, right? So it may signal sort of a type of thoughtfulness. Um, but that's that's you know and we have in earlier studies so earlier sort of much earlier versions of the scale we ask people uh explicitly whether more receptive people hold uh, are less confident in their beliefs and so we didn't find that so it's not sort of a lack of confidence but i do think it's a thoughtfulness that's signaled that's a great point um sort of following up on that uh, victor demyatovich asked uh whether there's a risk if you can be perceived as being too weak or when you're being receptive, or maybe you could think um, more broadly for some of these other questions, whether there are some downsides or situations where you might not want to be perceived as receptive. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like this is one of these topics that tends to, you know, like it really hits a button with people, especially these days, right? There's a real fear that uh, there are certain points of view that we kind of don't want to uh, elevate to, uh, you know, we don't want to validate with really listening to them. And what if appearing receptive makes us seem irresolute in our perspectives, or if it is somehow sanctioning uh, perspectives that, you know, as a society, we believe to be completely unacceptable. Um, so this comes up a lot when I give this talk. And what I would say in particular to this audience is that that is sort of a testable empirical question. Right, so we don't have to sort of debate uh, whether receptiveness is like good or bad overall. Uh, it is much more likely the case that uh, receptiveness is good for certain goals, right? Because it allows people to have more civil conversations and better collaboration over time. Uh, and to the extent that uh, you know people might uh, sort of think more negatively of a leader who is you know, receptive or uh, people might uh, believe a point of view that's sort of patently crazy and unacceptable, those are testable predictions. Um, and I think, and I think that's sort of one direction that we should be going. But overall, our research literature is full of sort of cognitive biases that we all agree are cognitive biases that stem from people treating their side as the end all and be all. Um, so I think in the world, there are a lot more situations where we could use more receptiveness and it's lacking uh, than the reverse. That's a, that's a fascinating point. Uh, Tony Hockley had an idea that I think may be related to that, which, and he wanted to know uh, whether there's a relationship between the positive value of receptiveness and the dominance of non-receptive language in the culture right now. Um, Tom, Tom Conforti specifically points out the idea of cancel culture uh, and whether receptiveness can help better navigate discussions with people with opposing views. And that seems particularly relevant these days. I wonder if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I mean, Mike, you and I have, you know, talked about this a lot, uh, is the idea that uh, it seems like receptiveness is evolving over time or lack of receptiveness is evolving over time. Um, and it's becoming, you know, it's becoming a kind of a more and more exciting topic for research. Uh, when I started this work uh, with uh, Francis Chen, uh, 
it was a calmer and more civil time. Um, and, <laughs> and so, and so this, this, this work has certainly uh, gotten a lot more attention uh, in our kind of current uh, contentious uh, environment. It would be great to find a data set where you could sort of track this over time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, another person asked about sort of the long-term follow-ups of some of these trainings. So whether receptiveness can last for months or even years. Ali Reza was curious about that. Yeah, so uh, Mike and I and uh, Francesca and Hannah have been talking about uh, kind of a longitudinal diary study, right? So imagine uh, training people uh, in a sort of a much more rigorous way than our little five minute intervention uh, and seeing uh, how their lives unfold, right? Can we uh, observe lower conflict in their organizational lives? Can we observe lower conflict in their marriages? Can we uh, intervene repeatedly by kind of pushing reminders at them uh, to see if they can um, relearn the lessons, right? I mean, it's one thing to be, one of the things we always talk about as co-authors is, is uh, how incredibly hard it is to be receptive in real life. Right. We often come to our research meetings talking about uh, our uh, life partners uh, and how difficult it is to apply these lessons kind of on the fly. Um, so I think it would be incredibly valuable to figure out a way to sort of inject receptiveness in the moment uh, and see if we can make people better in conflict um, at the time that it's happening. Uh, that's a great point. I know uh, over the course of collaborating with you so, for so many great years, I've become slowly become more receptive I, I hope uh, but it, it's been real uh, long and steady progress um, it, it related to that for some of the beginners just maybe as a final question both Chi Yin asked whether you could uh, recommend any reading uh, and in particular uh, uh, somebody asked about for beginners whether there's a good place for them to start uh so uh, the, the conversational receptiveness uh, paper uh, is out there in uh, organizational behavior and human decision processes. Um, so you can uh, pull up the paper and the recipe study is study four from that. So we have sort of the step-by-step -step instructions of how to you know, be receptive. Uh, if you want something even shorter than that, um, I have a short uh, CNN piece that I wrote about uh, the pandemic and some of the sort of drama we have about wearing and not wearing masks and how the receptiveness recipe can be applied to that. Um, and then Francesca has a piece in Scientific American uh, that talks about this uh, research program and also about um, a nonprofit organization called Braver Angels that we have been working with uh, who organizes workshops to bring partisans from uh, opposite sides together. Um, so all of those are sort of great resources, uh, but also uh, my email address is right there hanging out in front of you on the slide. So please feel free to sort of reach out with questions, follow feedback and I think I will get the transcript of the whole chat. So questions that we did not get to, uh, I will definitely ha have a chance to see and respond to. Yeah, that's a great point. I can already see a lot of interesting questions I don't think we'll be able to answer. Uh, for those of you uh, following along still, I pasted the link to Julia's article on CNN.com, which I think is a really great summary of some of the points we touched on here. But uh, I think I'm really excited to keep the conversation going with such an engaged audience. Um, uh, Maya, it looks like you're kind of staring us down and maybe uh, thinking about uh, taking over. Uh, is that right? Yes, we just want to thank you both so much for this wonderful conversation and to our wonderful audience. And um, like Julia said, there are ways to keep in touch with us. Uh, the recording uh, will be available. Uh, we will tweet uh, when it is publicly available. If you have any questions about BIG, you can reach out to me. And uh, with that, I think we're ready to close. Thank you all so much. Really, really appreciate it today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.